So, thank, thank you, you very much. Not at all, pleasure. Um, I will be reading those, um, those uh, questions that I have uh, prepared, just mm -hmm. to be sure that they are um, read <laughs> um, um, uh, accurately. So, this is the interview with Dr. Alexander Sturgis, the director of the Ashmolean uh, Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford. So this is the introduction. Dr. Alexander Sturgis is the director of the University of Oxford Ashmolean Museum. Dr. Sturgis was appointed to the present position in 2014 as a respected art historian and author of numerous publications, Ox University of Oxford alumnus, with a PhD from the Courtauld uh, Institute in London and with an accomplished career at the National Gal Gallery in London and the Holborn uh, Museum in Bath. Uh, the Ashmolean is the first public museum in the UK and most probably in the world. It was founded by Elias Ashmol in the 17th century and a building was constructed to store its collections. Today it is the Museum of uh, History of Science in Broad Street. Mm -hmm. The museum is now situated in Beaumont Street uh, and I can see it the back, its back entrance from the corridor uh, in front of my office at the Faculty of Classics. So it is a Real pleasure and privilege to have an interview with the head of such an important uh, and influential cultural institution. So my first question. At the beginning of the interview, I refer to the custodian principle presentation, which is available online, and we will provide the link on the site, which is both concise and comprehensive, revealing to the public your aims, principles and priorities as the head of the museum. As if answering my first question, in a remarkably efficient five-minute uh, exposition, you explained that your primary concern is to look after the collections and to ensure that they are handed over in the best condition to the future generations. How great is the responsibility of a custodian director in one of the most famous and appreciated museums of the world? Um, well, it clearly is um, incredibly important. I mean, so I think in terms of what museums are and what they do, clearly you are right that the the first thing we have to do as museum directors and curators is to care for our collections and to pass them on. And that is not as straightforward as it might seem. Um, obviously everything is deteriorating and degrading, nothing will last forever. And so the challenge really is to strike as sensible a balance as possible between preservation and conservation and accessibility. Uh, if some of members of the conservation department had their way, everything would be locked up in dark boxes and no one would be allowed to see it as the best way to preserve a collection. But of course that's, um, that would be ridiculous and actually the conservation department would think so too. Uh, but a balance has to be struck. Uh, but it is you know, it's a very great responsibility and one that does occasionally keep you awake at night. Right, it does really sound uh, <laughs> excited, <laughs> exciting. So, um, preserving the permanent collections comprises mm -hmm. not only conservation, but also enhancement and development, including new acquisitions. Mm -hmm. So, Elias, uh, Elias Ashmole uh, was a keen collector, and he had a huge collection prior to donating it to the university. What were the main pieces of acquisition since you became director? And are you satisfied with the conditions of these acquisitions and the rate at which they are acquired? So, yes. Uh, so, the Ashmole, in, in common with almost every museum, in, uh, certainly in the UK, has very little in the way of an acquisition budget. Mm -hmm. So, if we want to make a really significant uh, acquisition by buying something, we have to raise that money. Uh, and so, in my time here, we've done. We've had two major acquisition mm -hmm. campaigns. One was to acquire uh, the painting by Turner of Oxford High Street, and the other was to buy a hoard of coins that was discovered near Watlington, so in um, Oxfordshire, uh, from the late 9th century, so mm -hmm. the, the 870s, this moment when Alfred the Great was chasing the Vikings out of um, out of Wessex. Um, and so those were major acquisitions that required major fundraising effort. But most of our acquisitions come through legacies and bequests and gifts. And actually, and then within the UK, there's a very um, important uh, scheme called the uh, acceptance in lieu scheme, which allows 
people to leave significant works of art to public galleries and museums in lieu of inheritance tax. And so that is another way that really significant things come to the museum. So again, the first acquisition under my directorship was a, a wonderful painting by Constable of Willie Lott's Cottage, and that was through the acceptance and new scheme. And so, and actually one of the sort of surprises and excitements in being the director here at the museum is quite how many things uh, and really exciting things are both left to the museum or, um, or given to the museum uh, through the acceptance and lieu scheme or through the generosity of um, benefactors and donors. And so the collections do continue to grow in all sorts of ways. Of course, having said that, we need to be uh, disciplined in deciding what we do accept and what we don't. So we do have a collection strategy that we and so we measure potential gifts and legacies against that strategy to see whether it is something that would really enhance the collection and increase uh, either build on a particular strength or occasionally sort of fill a particular gap in the collection. Right, of course. Um, so another essential aspect of collections custody is to communicate their value to the public. Mm. Uh, in addition to impressive permanent exhibition, the Ashmolean regularly organizes special exhibitions and the comp uh, accompanying talks, tours, courses, workshops and other exhibition events for visitors. For instance, uh, families, young people, etc. Mm. It is obvious that the Ashmolean wants to present to the public. What are the social topics and concerns that Ashmolean wishes to raise awareness about? So, you're right, that uh, of course looking after the collection is incredibly important, uh, enhancing the collection is incredibly important, but the work of the museum, you know, its job, is really where the public meet the collection. And so, to try and work to ensure that that, that encounter, that public and all sorts of different people have with the objects and with the works of art in our collection and to make that as enriching and engaging and stimulating as right. possible. And of course one of the challenges is precisely the variety of the people who walk through the door. Some know lots, some know nothing, mm -hmm. uh, some don't have any idea what they're going to encounter in the museum, others are specialists coming particularly to look at their particular area of specialism and you somehow need to engage all those people. Mm -hmm. um, so in broad terms what does one want to communicate I suppose it is that we have here some of the great creations of humanity from you know millennia BC to, to almost yesterday and to celebrate that fact and I think also to draw connections between different cultures between different times to suggest uh, actually what is fundamental and important about the human condition, um, you know, that our concerns now are obviously different but they're not completely different to the concerns of uh, people throughout history and to draw those connections to suggest commonalities I think is something that museums inevitably do and in order to make collections come alive it's a, it's a key element of what we need to do to suggest the relevance of historic objects to people today. So to continue that thought, the Ashmolean is, in your words, the teaching museum founded and functioning within the University of Oxford and contains the assets which are used in researching and understanding the world. Mm. So the museum is renewed both for its impressive collections as well as for its research excellence. What are the major current research projects of the museum? So, yes, we are a university museum, and so I think that brings with it particular obligations around research and around teaching. So, uh, and teaching particularly to undergraduates and uh, postgraduates within the university. Of course, we teach children uh, from, of all ages and, can t and teach adults of all ages as well. But, uh, so, teaching is critical, but so too is research. Um, and so, because actually, building knowledge about our collections is, uh, is essential if we are to engage people with them. So among the research projects that we have going on at the moment are within, we have a coin department, the mm -hmm. Heberden Coin Room, and they are conducting a 
extraordinary research project on um, Roman provincial coinage and, and coin hoards and uh, linking up collections, not only from our collection but the other great coin collections of the world, to, to create a huge sort of database that allows one to see through the coin hoards of the Roman Empire um, how, uh, how ideas moved, how people moved, how economies changed, and so it becomes a tool for, for understanding the Roman Empire. Um, another completely different project for which we've just received uh, European Research Council money is uh, looking at colour in the Victorian period. In the, uh, and not only the technological aspects of colour, so the invention of new dyes and new colours in the uh, second half of the 19th century, but critically also the, um, the symbolic um, ideas around colour within Victorian literature and how that might re reflect or is reflected in the art, both decorative arts and um, and paintings and sculptures of the period as well, and so, and that's going to lead to a major exhibition in four years' time. I, think. I just wanted uh, to ask whether that will lead. This will be a really yes. colourful. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> so we hope so. A really exciting right. exhibition in four years' time, and then uh, again, uh, just to give a sense of the range of the research projects that are going on, we. Um, have a project uh, being conducted by a curator of uh, the ancient Near East mm -hmm. who is working with University College in London but also with museums in Iraq mm -hmm. to look at um, how, uh, well really to support through uh, research uh, heritage professionals in Iraq to, to build their expertise and to develop ways in which they can engage their local populations with their heritage as a means of, of protecting that heritage. Right, right. That, that's, that's like a current um, issue around the world about uh, preservation of heritage. Absolutely, and, yes, absolutely. And so the, and it's clearly a priority and it cannot be done, if you like, from outside. So the, right. this project is all about building both expertise and knowledge on the ground right. and and with expertise and knowledge comes commitment and comes mm -hmm. a sense of ownership of yeah. one's own heritage and therefore um, a way of preserving it. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching and edu uh, educa educating uh, it's, is also relevant to your own career, starting in the education department at the National Gallery in London, followed by being the curator of exhibitions and programs for six years. Among the books you have written are Dance Angel, a detective's guide to the language of painting from 2003, and as a co-author, Understanding Paintings, Themes in Art Explored and Explained from 2000. Understanding the value of art is essential for its appreciation and protection. After years of personal endeavors in this area, do you find it difficult to make the general public interested in the value of art rather than in the comparatively trivial monetary uh, value of the works of art? Um, no, I'm not going to be a pessimist about this. Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, so you're right that my museum career started in the education department at the National Gallery, and so, and really that has coloured my entire career within museums, so my starting point was talking to the public, both school children as they came through the door who had never come into a museum before, um, and also, you know, uh, both tourists and, and then again more informed, more engaged members of the public. And the fact is that once you get anyone in front of a painting, if you're there talking to them, you can excite people with these, uh, I mean, particularly in the National Gallery, you, don't, you can't really help but excite people with these the extraordinary things, the extraordinary works that they hold. And of course, here too, we have astonishing paintings and works of art from across all sorts of periods. Um, I think the challenge is that most visitors don't have someone with them to talk to, to ask questions of. Um, and, and as I suggested earlier, everyone has different questions that they will be asking of a work of art. And so a challenge for a museum, and it's one we're thinking about, particularly at the moment, is how, how do you meet the needs of this 
wide variety of visitors. Um, and one way is through exhibitions and programmes and talks so that one can do different things with uh, the collection. But within galleries too, I think we could do better than we do at the moment in terms of thinking about the different needs of different visitors and how we might meet them. Right. But just to mention, the Eshmolian's uh, education, uh, educational activities mm -hmm. are, are really broad and, 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 and of huge spectre. They are. Everybody. So I think um, <laughs> what's absolutely clear is if anyone engages with our programs, yeah. they have a fantastic Yes, program. absolutely. Um, uh, the visitors, I suppose, were worrying about a bit at the moment or thinking about mm -hmm. is those that come when there isn't a course, when there isn't a, a family study day or, mm -hmm. or a, um, when there isn't an activity. How can we make them feel um, at home and not feel daunted? And of course museums can be daunting places uh, and they can be exhausting places right. but they can also be and one hopes they will always be fantastically exciting places. Mm -hmm. Right, so as an author you published a number of books and some of them with intriguing and incentive titles, Rebels and Martyrs, the image of the artist in the 19th century from 2006, for example. I'll read this book as soon as I finish my task of publishing this interview, but can you satisfy my curiosity? Are, there, uh, are the 19th century artists more rebels and martyrs or both equally? So that was a catalogue to an exhibition I curated at the National Gallery, which was about really the image of the artist and how it developed, particularly in the 19th century. In fact, my original thought for the exhibition was a far broader survey of uh, how artists depicted themselves or were thought about from the Renaissance to the modern day. But as I developed the idea for the exhibition that one became perhaps inevitably more and more focused on to the romantic idea of the artist and this sort of revolutionary uh, idea where suddenly a lot of things that still are familiar and indeed are quite difficult to shake off the, the idea of the lonely struggling artist uh, fighting against society alone in their attics uh, suffering misunderstood um, and that somehow that is linked to the creative spirit mm -hmm. is an idea that really is born in uh, the early 19th century um, and and in some ways, one would say it's dead now, but actually it doesn't go away. It's still many people's idea of the artist is that they need to suffer, they need yes. to be alone, they need to... <laughs> in order to um, produce yeah, this... they need to be yes. misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if one looks at the sort of successful artists of today, I mean, mm. we've got a Jeff Koons exhibition here yes. at the Ashmolean as I speak. I mean, one couldn't imagine an artist less like that stereotype. Um, than uh, Coons. So, so it was thinking about uh, that development in the, the role of the artist and the idea of the artist in the 19th century, really from the Romantic period uh, to the early 20th century. And, where, and really the idea becomes more and more extreme, if you like. And so mm -hmm. by the end, uh, in the late 1890s and the early 20th century, artists um, such as Sheila and um, Kokoschka and others are painting themselves mm -hmm. as, literally as martyrs, or as Christ, actually, often with um, sort of being killed for their art uh, and suffering in that way. So, are you preparing a new book or a publication, and when can we expect it? Um, no, I'm not right at the moment. I mean, I, so I have some ideas uh, for exhibitions that I would like to do here, but it's just running a museum of this scale is um, is rather time consuming, and okay. so it's finding the space in which I might be able to do that, and so I'm just thinking about that at the moment. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Right, so um, it was a pleasure to meet you during the GLAM, so galleries, uh, libraries and museums mm -hmm. uh, of Oxford, staff and volunteer party in the uh, Ashmolean Museum last December. Uh, in a relaxed but inspiring atmosphere, you gave a speech about the achievements of the museum during 2018. At one point you became almost short, short of breath, um, uh, as there were so many topics to mention. So could you choose and point out some of them now? Uh, are there 
any particularly close to your personal focus on interest of interest? Did you the, did you have some goals that needed to be? Um, uh, <laughs> so yes, I suppose one of the things that I felt when I um, arrived at the museum was uh, that although. When everyone met someone from the Ashmolean mm -hmm. or uh, talked about it, there was uh, they talked about the extraordinary history of this museum and its role as arguably the world's oldest public museum. And yet, within the museum itself, that that story was not really embodied and not mm -hmm. really um, discoverable. And so, uh, one of the things I wanted. To do was to create a gallery that told that story more effectively um, and brought some of those founding collections together and displayed them in a way that was not to recreate the, uh, the sort of cabinet of curiosities that Ashmole originally gave to Oxford but at least to give a sense of it and so uh, that we did manage to do last year with the opening of the um, Ashmolean Story Gallery, and so that was something that um, I was particularly pleased to see happen. That's the one on the minus one level yes. of the museum, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, so that was exciting, and then I suppose, well, exhibitions are always mm -hmm. uh, exciting, and, the, uh, and so in terms of uh, last year, the, well, both shows were close to my heart in different ways, uh, but the show on American modernism was an idea that I had had really and was able to make happen with the support of people who actually did all the work, I mean particularly the curator Katie Bourguignon. Um, but I was really excited to bring those paintings because I've always loved that period of American art. It's one that I know is, is very... Um, well, it's not at all well known in this country. It's very difficult to see paintings by the artists such as Demuth and Sheila and, and even O'Keefe and Hopper in uh, the UK. And so it was great to be able to bring these pictures together um, of that quality and show them here in Oxford. Right. Um, the, okay, so we are moving on to the privilege to stay in a museum after hours is usually available to the staff only. But the museum uh, organizes various outreach events during which it stays open after hours. For instance, Life Friday, Eshmoyan after hours, and some others, uh, enabling visitors the same museum-related excitement. What are the most ex uh, engaging outreach project and uh, projects, and what needs to be taken into consideration when organizing them? Maybe okay. some sec security issues or something, because museum is saying. Um, open until yes so regular. well the live fridays are wonderful uh they are wonderful events and right. in which thousands of people team yes. into the museum uh all sorts of activities take place within the museum and yes some of those unquestionably do present some challenges in right. terms of look uh ensuring that the collection is suitably uh, looked after mm -hmm. during those events. So, I mean, dance and um, is always slightly alarming at times, um, and and crowds too. But but again, as I said earlier, the key I think for museums is to strike a sensible balance between uh, license and prescription, and uh, allowing things to happen, and and ensuring that they happen in a way that is managed and careful, but not. Uh, not overly prescriptive, and I think um, that the Ashmolean, I hope and believe, strikes a very good balance in that regard. Right. Um, let me just check if this, this is fine. Right. So, volunteering is another important aspect in the museum's organization. Volunteers help in organizing and conducting various events uh, in the museum, um, contribute to its activities and gain experience doing so. Last year, I was a volunteer at the Ashmolean myself, and I particularly enjoyed participating in a project organized to celebrate the Ashmolean's acquisition of William, Dobson, uh, William Dobson's painting group portrait of P Prince Rupert, Colonel William Legg, and Colonel John Ruff. 
Russell mm. uh, on the 40th, uh, 400th anniversary of the birth of uh, Elias Ashmole. Is there a possibility of utilizing the potential of professional, professionally qualified uh, volunteers, archaeologists, historians, um, art historians, by giving them more challenging tasks? Uh, does this experience increase their chances for future employment in the museum? So, yeah, no, volunteers are, well, incredibly important at the Ashmolean and incredibly important, I think, in the cultural sector and many other sectors, it has to be said, throughout the country. I mean, one of the, the key things about volunteers is, of course, that they are instantly astonishing ambassadors for the museum in that they're there, they're here because... They love the place, and they want uh, they want to be engaged with it. And so, if one can harness that those levels of enthusiasm and and communicate that to the visitor as they arrive, I think that's incredibly powerful. And indeed, at my previous museum, the Holborn, the entire front of house staff were volunteers, and um, and that built into something really quite extraordinary. Because the other element of um, of museums and volunteers is ensuring that we give volunteers what they are looking for through their mm -hmm. volunteering. And I think what your question is sort of um, suggests is that volunteers have very different motivations for volunteering. Right. Um, and so, and I think one's got to be alert to that, that mm -hmm. some are, for some it's entirely social, uh, for mm -hmm. others it's about sort of giving something back for uh, but for others still it is actually about developing their skills and developing their uh, CV and developing right. um, their employability skills and one's got to uh, recognize that as well there is of course a balance to be struck and the risk and the risk is that one does start um, essentially exploiting volunteers uh, particularly perhaps those with the professional skills. skills that one is using them in roles that really should be being performed by paid members of uh, staff, and so that's a that is a balancing act that we are, you know, very conscious of here mm -hmm. in the museum. One of the projects that we are seeking to um, develop this year, I mean, and building on work we've already done, is to uh, consider how we can use. Um, students and early career researchers within mm -hmm. the museum to actually um, how we can support them mm -hmm. in developing their skills while at the same time uh, allowing them to deliver a public service through giving talks and uh, lectures around their particular areas of expertise or their particular areas of interest and so um, and this is something that the American University Museums mm -hmm. do very well uh, but it needs to be done in earnest and it needs to have the the needs, if you like, of the uh, those early career researchers and postgraduates in mind. So that it needs to actually give them skills and can't just, if you like, right. exploit their skills. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to get right. As the director of an archaeological and art history museum, how are you personally involved with the field of archaeology? What are your favourite archaeological artefacts in the museum? I have to ask that, being an right. archaeologist. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so my personal um, responsibilities for archaeology are very limited, except, of course, that I have, um, uh, you know, I have these extraordinary archaeological collections uh, within the museum and wonderful uh, curators and others who, some of whom are actively engaged in archaeological uh, excavations both in this country and indeed in Egypt and indeed in Turkey as well so um, so yes I oversee but I don't get involved in terms of my favorite archaeological objects I suppose um, well the most extraordinary collection here which I was shamefully ignorant of before I arrived here, is the pre-dynastic Egyptian mm -hmm. collections, the, uh, the um, collections discovered in Heracompolis, which are simply astonishing in their sort of extreme age, but also the you know the refinement of some of them. Um, a particular wonderful little lapis lazuli uh, woman 
still missing her feet, but uh, it's just an astonishing little thing. Um, but early in my time here, the other great sort of exciting discovery was Ostraca, which I didn't, again, I was shamefully ignorant of, these little shards of stone, lots with just scribbled writing of the most mundane kind. Um, there's a wonderful one downstairs in the galleries, uh, which uh, explains that two workmen won't turn up because they've been bitten by scorpions. And so, which immediately take you straight back to ancient Egypt, and in that case, in the most amazing way. So they're so, that because they're so mundane, they are also very immediate. So, um, in your spare time, you are also an accomplished magician. Uh, when did that interest start? Uh, the title of your book from 1994 is Magic in Art, Chicks' Perspective, Illusions, but this refers to a symbolic meaning of magic. Uh, is your interest in magic related to the rec recent exhibition Spellbound, an interesting and much praised exhibition, soon to be reviewed for Archaeologia, uh, our site? My favorite ex ex exhibit was a mummy of a cat that fell down a chimney while chasing a mouse, but uh, the main exhibit was a witch in a bottle from Oxford's Pitt Rivers Museum. How often do you s collaborate with other Oxford and UK museums? So, lots of questions. Sir. So, I've been doing magic forever. I mean, oh, so I was cool. a conjurer for, as a child, uh, I sort of did tricks and then just continued doing it. So, it's been a lifelong sort of enthusiasm and pastime. Um, and so, obviously, there have been moments where I've thought how, uh, where, yes, that interest and my professional life in museums has come together. Um, so, at the National Gallery, I did some magic shows for children, introducing them to, to the paintings in the uh, gallery, so taking, doing tricks with or around those paintings. Um, but the Spellbound exhibition was, if you like, another connection, but clearly the exhibition was not about the sort of playful tricks that I do. <laughs> uh, it was, something, it was uh, more fundamental about the need uh, or our use of magical thinking and possibly our need for magical thinking and right. uh, and looking at the history of magic uh, really from the Middle Ages to, I suppose, today. Um, but yes, I was, as a subject, it's such an incredibly rich one and clearly, you know, my, my interest in tricks is not unrelated to the richness of the subject of magic. Right. Uh, well, how, how often do you collaborate with other Oxford UK museums? Uh, well, an enormous amount. So, uh, you mentioned GLAM earlier, so the mm -hmm. Gardens, Libraries and Museums. So, uh, there are four university museums in, uh, within Oxford. Uh, the Pitt Rivers, the Natural History Museum and the Museum of the History of Science. And so, we work together across a whole range of activities. I mean, um, from exhibitions, in the case of Spellbound, the Pitt Rivers was the largest single lender to that show, and so in many ways that exhibition was a way of showcasing some of the extraordinary right. things they have in the, their collections. But we work together with them and the Botanic Gardens and the Bodleian mm -hmm. Libraries on a whole range of, um, of things. Uh, as far as other museums in the UK and indeed beyond, Again, we're always working with mm -hmm. colleagues. I mean, the, one of the joys of working in museums actually is that we, as a, as a sector, we are very, I would say, supportive of each other mm -hmm. and collegiate. And so every exhibition depends on loans and uh, from countless lenders, many museums, both nationally and internationally. And where possible, we work with museums on exhibition, so our great Raphael show mm -hmm. that we uh, had recently was also was curated in partnership with the Albertina in Vienna. We're working on a Rembrandt exhibition which we're uh, in collaboration with the Lachenhal in Leiden and, and so on. Right. Okay, our last question. The Ashmolean displays one artifact originating from Croatia. Well, maybe there are more, but I know that one in particular. So the magnificent, magnificent marble head of the Empress Livia, found in the village Vid near Metković in the Dubrovnik area, mm -hmm. 
uh, was sold to Sir Arthur Evans in the 19th century and in 2014 it was lent to the gal gallery Klovičevi Dvor in Zagreb for the exhibition to be reunited with the body as an example of literally, um, literally complementary international collaboration. Are there other pieces of art in the Ash Molian that could possibly be assembled with similar project of uh, international collaboration? That's a very good question, <laughs> and I don't know the answer to it. Oh, no. uh, uh, but I'm sure that I'm sure there could be and should be, and, yeah. and I would hope there will be. So, um, the other great collection assembled by Arthur Evans is the Bronze Age Greek collection from uh, from Crete, from Knossos, um, and again, uh, we've just appointed a new curator of um, Bronze Age Greece. Um, and so one of the things that I'm hoping he will be doing is working with the Greeks and, um, and the Cretans to, to think about how we can uh, use our collections and those that are still in Crete and bring them together again probably as an exhibition but, but could that also be done digitally as well. Well, I would like to thank you for the interview on behalf of our readers as, as you consider them the most important visitors to the museum, the future generations. Thank you very much. Not at all. <laughs> thank you.